I'm fascinated by neurotechnology. I'm terrified <laughs> by neurotechnology. I have a very special guest today. I've got Nita Farahani. She is an expert on this stuff, an expert on the impact and ethics of emerging technology. She is professor of law and philosophy at Duke Law School. She's done a ton of speaking and writing on neuroscience and bioethics. You may have seen her TED Talk on YouTube. Back in 2010, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. She's got degrees in genetics, cell and developmental biology, and she's author of the book, The Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in the Age of of neurotechnology. Nita, may I call you Nita? I want to call you professor or No, your please honor call me Nita. Okay, because you've <laughs> no, got this Nita's pedigree. <laughs> Thank you for uh, coming down from the great halls of academia to splash in the shallow waters with me today. <laughs> I, I loved your book and I read it with tremendous wonder and awe. And then I went back to the closet and I shut off the light and closed the door and just rocked back and forth for about an hour. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of conversations with my wife, Natalie, about not turning into my parents. Nina, do you ever have that conversation? Like, I don't want to turn into my parents. Right. Yes. Yes. Like it's this newfangled technology back in my day, we did it right. So I don't want to be the person resistant to I oh, know the new stuff coming down, new ways of thinking, living our lives, etc. But uh, we're talking about technology that can read minds. Uh, would you even use those words, read minds? Depends on what you think your mind is, but yeah, I mean, it can. I say read brains, um, but certainly you can decode a lot of what's happening in the human brain, and depending on the technology, it can even read whatever the mind is. So, well, I mean, I, I know this is a long answer that I'm asking you to give in a short way, but let's talk about brain waves. They act mm -hmm. and react in ways that can be measured. Can you sort of let us play in that sandbox as yeah. civilians? Yeah, let's do it. So, okay. you know, the average person thinks thousands of thoughts per day as they think neurons in their brain are firing um, with any particular thought or brain state, say you're happy or sad, hundreds and thousands of neurons are firing in your brain in concurrent patterns. And those patterns of electrical activity and the tiny discharge that they give off can be picked up by brain sensors. Brain sensors are just like the sensors you might have in your Apple Watch or um, in your you know ring that you wear that picks up your temperature and your sleep patterns or your Fitbit. But these sensors pick up that electrical activity and then sophisticated machine learning algorithms, so AI, can just like it decodes patterns of activity and everything else and translates what those patterns mean, can take those patterns and say, aha, this pattern of electrical activity means this person is happy or sad or their mind is wandering or they're bored or they're engaged or that is recognition of this particular sequence of numbers, which is their PIN number or their home address. And so, um, you know, what's happening in your brain, your brain waves, the different waves correspond to this firing of electrical activity in your brain that AI decodes. So I've got an Apple watch, which I'm obsessed with. By the way, I've taken 1,583 steps today. I don't know. I'm obsessed with my should we, steps. Should we do this while walking? Because that's not a lot of steps. <laughs> it was the comedian who said that like, she registered a step by drinking a glass of wine in the arm movement. With, <laughs> nice. you know, she drank three miles that day. Do I need to think about a future where I'm, maybe I'm already in it, where my smartwatch is reading more than just my pulse, my heart rate, my steps? You know, what's funny is... um. Uh, about a week ago, I, I went to my mailbox and um, a neuroscientist had sent me an Apple Watch and asked me to download the application that they've developed that picks up um, neural activity through your Apple Watch by uh, some algorithm that they've trained on the kind of in between your heart rate or something like that. I don't know exactly how the science works on this, but supposedly it picks up immersion and engagement. Like you can watch, uh, you know, commercials or video and uh, it will, based on the algorithm that has been trained on your Apple Watch, 
help pick up what your emotional state is from your brain in doing so. Now, I say that, you know, with a grain of salt, because I haven't investigated it. I don't know more than it that about it. But the short answer is like, yeah, your Apple Watch is going to already be able to do that. Um, and then there are sensors that are not yet in your Apple Watch. What your Apple Watch has is probably ECG. Are you able to pick up your heart rate in your Apple Watch? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, so then apparently you can measure your brain activity too. But what Meta is developing that will be embedded in a watch is um, they're called EMG sensors, electromyography. And electromyography picks up brain activity as it goes from your brain down your arm to your wrist. Um, and when you type or swipe or anything else you do with your hands, those neurons go from your brain down the wrist and those sensors can pick up your intention to type or swipe and not just like a general intention, like Seth wants to swipe or type, but Seth wants to type, you know, Nita Farahani out onto his computer and decode literally the, you know, typing of Nita Farahani out onto the computer or any number of things that you might intend to do with your hands, including very private ones. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> the the point is, the, the sensors don't have to be on your head to pick up brain activity because your brain sends signals throughout your body and you can pick up from what's called your peripheral nervous system, the signals that are sent out by having sensors on those other parts of your body. All right. So the dystopiast, which probably isn't a word, but I'm going to use it as a word. The dystopiast in me is starting to panic, but we're going to come back to that. And you brought up- It, it already tech. did. You went to the closet and rocked for a I while. Did, I did. So. I, <laughs> but I've now emerged back into the light so that we can continue our conversation. Before I get into big tech and meta, who you just brought up, and I have in my prep, I want to put that back down and talk about some of the positives. I mean, Good. being able that. to- read brain waves, brain activity might help us to screen for certain and probably even more than just brain related illnesses, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, far more. So, you know, I'm not a Luddite about this technology, right? I, I actually um, think that part of the solution that I you know, propose in this book is, is to give people a robust right to self-determination over their brains and mental experiences. And by that, I mean, a right to access and to enhance and to change their brains. And that's because we haven't until now taken brain health and wellness as seriously as we have all of the rest of our physical health. You're wearing an Apple Watch, you know the number of steps that you've taken today. You can quantify a whole bunch of things about yourself, but you know virtually nothing about your own brain activity other than through your internal software of self-reflection, which is probably not that accurate. Um, but, you know, should you know, for example, when you focus best or where you focus best or what time of day is, you know, better for learning or better for running, um, better for sleeping, which, you know, which times you have the most restful sleep and what the right uh, kinds of activities are that enhance your mental performance or your flow state. These are all possibilities with uh, brain activity sensors. But for the people who want to go further still, you know, epileptics, um, uh, you know, a dear family friend who I called my aunt growing up, she suffered from an epileptic seizure and died uh, because she didn't have advance warning of the seizure. And she choked having, you know, thrown up from the seizure. No one was there. If she'd had early warning of that seizure, she would, I am sure, be here with us today. She died far too young. And with brain sensors, there are tiny electrical changes that happen in the brain before you have a seizure. And already using these consumer wearable devices, um, researchers have found that minutes to up to an hour before an epileptic seizure, you can find out that a person is about to suffer from that seizure. And that could be life transforming or glioblastoma. I have a friend who passed away from a glioblastoma, John McCain, a year from the time he was diagnosed until he died, um, was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. It's a very aggressive form of brain cancer. Most people, when they present, already have electrical changes that can be detected by EEG. And those electrical changes apparently happen much earlier. And early detection is critical for it actually being something that is treatable. 
And you would see those tiny electrical changes if you were wearing brain sensors in your earbuds and in your, you know, uh, headphones or in your watch on a daily basis. Maybe not your watch for the for the glioblastoma, but at least in you know your earbuds and in your headphones or the tiny tattoos behind your ears. So there's a lot of good that can come: mental illness, depression, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease. Like we could just rattle them all off, and it's promising in your own hands, empowered to actually have access to your own brain health and well-being and do something about it, I think that could be revolutionary. The problem is the risk, right? And how we safeguard against the risk to make that happy, optimistic future something that, you know, is possible to enjoy without living in like the Orwellian dystopian closet that you had to lock yourself into, um, which is also a very real possibility from all of this. And the skeptic slash cynic in me does where i mean i walk outside and just look up and say hi google right i mean somebody's right. watching i right. i do feel like i live in a surveillance culture and i feel like i'm i'm part of the problem yeah, would you like to use this platform and then there's the terms and conditions right. and it's 50 digital pages in seven point font and i just scroll to the bottom and click i agree because i'm ready to get to the good stuff i have no idea what i signed well, that's the, the truth problem, is that right? like you don't have a choice, really, right? I mean, you can say I have a choice and that I don't have to use the product, but maybe you need it to do your job or even just to function in society. I think the terms of service have become a joke, right? It's like, oh, yeah, let's scroll to the bottom and say, okay, of course I read the 70 pages of the terms of service that just gave away all of my you know, data and personal information in order to be able to run this simple search term. That's idiotic. But more than that, it doesn't have to be the way it is when it comes to our brain data. Like we don't have to allow for the same terms of service that say you have to give away your brain data in order to gain access. That can simply be a barter that is not legal. And I think with the right that I propose, the right to cognitive liberty, that should not be part of the terms of service, that it cannot be a bartered for system where you have to give access to your brain data to have access to services. That's an interesting term that you use in the book and you just use now when I'm going to come back to it, cognitive liberty. By the way, I'm talking with Nita Farahani. She is author of the book, Battle for Your Brain. You mentioned social media meta, or I did, one of us did. <laughs> there's some privacy problems. I mean, we're talking about, there's mismanagement of our private data. You would agree with that? Well, I would agree that that might be the understatement of the hour. Okay. <laughs> well, sorry yes. about that. Yeah. All right. That's a football I'm throwing in your side on the, your yes. side of the field. You just social media and the big techs and all that and privacy. Just take that where you want. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, so maybe it's like, are we playing the game of like, which one of these things is not like the other, which is like social media and big tech and privacy. And if if it is, then I would say the one that is not like the others is privacy. <laughs> so, um, you know, social media, big tech, uh, what they have discovered is that the most valuable thing that they collect about individuals is their personal data and the commodification of that data selling the data or selling it to advertisers in, in order to be able to micro target pro products to people is where the money comes in. There are no such thing as free services. You pay for the service with your data. And we're all familiar with this by now. We understand that we are the product, um, but most people don't think they have a choice. Or I often hear this, which is like, yeah, but I got this really great product in my feed and I bought it and I liked it. You know, and so like it's getting better at giving me exactly the kinds of products that I want. Okay, uh, I can buy that and maybe people are okay with that or like, I don't have anything to hide. So what am I worried about? Nobody thinks that about their brains. Nobody. I mean, everybody has bad thoughts. Everybody has thoughts that they don't want shared with other people. Everybody, you know, has had the, you know, experience of having a friend be like, do you like this new shirt? And you think, no. No, I don't. I think it is hideous, right? <laughs> but you're not going to telegraph that. You're going to say, of course, I like your new shirt. It looks you know, fantastic on you. Um, or you know, whatever it is, there is a whole private inner monologue, an inner space that we have of mental reprieve where we can think whatever we want to think. And that is different in kind than the things that we express through our online searches or through our like buttons or through 
our financial transactions or our GPS location data, all of which is at least express behavior, there's still that thing happening on the inside. And that thing is something that social media and tech titans should not by default have access to. That thing, even if we suddenly have the ability to track our brain health and wellness and well-being, should not be that we get access to our health and well-being in exchange for our privacy of our mental, you know, internal form. Oh, Nita, I, I'm, I'm guilty. I've got that dark place in my brain that I'm sure everybody <laughs> has. I, I remember my shirt. I know you were. You were thinking like, okay, no, yeah, no need. No. That's a lovely shirt. It really I is. I was darker. <laughs> I was going darker. One of my I, first. I was giving you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> one of my first employers was one of the worst human beings I've ever met. The way he treated people was terrible. <laughs> oh, and in oh. the dark recesses of my brain, I fantasized about him yeah. having an aneurysm. I mean, I'm not proud right. of it, right? I was just no, right. in that dark moment. You and know? you don't really want that because you wouldn't really want that for anybody. But I, I get it. You go to these places where you're like, you know what? If you got hit by a truck, I could imagine that for a moment and for a second getting satisfaction out of that. You cut me off in traffic. I, you know, would I like to see you into a ditch just for a microsecond? And then the civilized yes. part of my brain takes over. Right. Right. If I can be measured and surveilled, would someone say that I am then a danger because I wish harm on another? Is that hyperbole? I mean, so it's hyperbole only in the sense that these devices can't quite do that yet, right? They're not going to pick up um, the literal thought of like, I hope you find yourself in a ditch. But the rage you feel it's going to get that, right? So the rage, the disgust, the emotional reaction, um, a lot of that kind of stuff can already be decoded right now. And frankly, you know, we do a pretty good job of of putting on our civil hat and keeping those feelings in check. You know, you get home, your spouse, um, here's a good one. Yesterday, my spouse was supposed to... Uh, tell our caregiver to pick up our child from school because she had a half day of school. 1230, I get a call from her school and um, they were like, hey there, your daughter's here. You know, nobody, nobody picked her up. Well, of course, he forgot to tell the caregiver to pick her up. What did I feel? I felt rage, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, then I went to go pick up my child because I had to, you know, kind of drop everything to go get her. Our caregiver was taking care of our other child who was asleep. Um, and did I want my daughter to know that I was feeling rage? No, I wanted her to experience only like her loving, happy mother, delighted to see her pick her up and take her home and then get back to work. We do this all the time. We we have a lot going on inside that we choose not to express outside intentionally because it helps us navigate the world, but it also allows us to decide what we're sharing and with whom. And, you know, do I want telegraphed to my daughter rage when all I want her to experience is love? Absolutely not, right? We get to decide with whom and when and under what circumstances we share that. If I could at the same time have transmitted just by text message some rage to my partner, I would have been okay <laughs> with that, That's right? <laughs> but, you know, again, it's, it's about the choices. It's about being able to decide what's happening on the inside and with whom you share it and under what circumstances, that's got to be up to us. That's fundamental to what it means to be human. Well, back to big tech and uh, the corporations and whatnot, the industry of outrage, if they can see my buttons, if I'm broadcasting my buttons, here's what they are, here's where they are. All they have to do is push them, right? It's outrage for clicks. Somebody gets paid. They right. get more scroll time. I mean, people have right. weaponized outrage in that way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I worry a lot about this, right? We're not talking just about reading the brain. We're talking about writing to the brain. And that doesn't have to be through a device that's literally hooked up to your brain. So, you know, Meta has announced its neural interface watch is going to launch in early 2025. And it's going to be integrated with WhatsApp and Instagram. And that means like the same company that can read your brain activity is also giving you the environment in which you're interacting with, right? And it can pick up like, okay, I need to change the feed ever so much and the features ever so much because I'm not getting the right rage-based reaction, which brings this person over and again back to the same environment. It's a closed loop system 
of being able to both read and change what you are interacting with and do that at scale, right? Understand how people are reacting much more precisely and then being able to manipulate the technology and the platforms and the social media that we consume and the way it's structured and the algorithms that decide what's on the for you and what comes next. That's a frightening world because it's already something that's happening a lot in social media, which is it's it's designed with technology, it's designed with features meant to, you know, be clickbait to tap into our brain heuristics, our cognitive biases. Most of that's based on the assumption of how you're going to react quickly and not think critically and become addicted to technology. But when you can literally see it, right, you're the company who can collect the brain data and much more precisely calibrate your technology to achieve those goals. That concerns me deeply. That on left a, me in the closet for a while, but then I had to write my book. So I came you out. You finally emerged. <laughs> yes, I okay, emerged you and, and I, will I started be writing. Yes. Our moment in the sun right here. Yes. Beyond um, the outrage for clicks, what about the construction of an alternate reality? I mean, that plays into yeah. conspiracist and the anti-scientist. If the algorithms are feeding on each other, and mm -hmm. before you know it, you live in a world that may not actually exist, right? Have you read The Anomaly? No. Well, so should good. I? Is it terrifying? Like <laughs> it's so it's so so good. It's so good. Um, I, I'll I'll leave it there. I'll say everybody should read it. I thought it was the fantastic. Anomaly. Um, okay. The right. anomaly. Uh, but okay. So who knows where we're going with VR? Right. Um, right now the headsets are pretty heavy. They're cumbersome. The bandwidth, the computing bandwidth, isn't large enough to really enable enough people to be in there. The games still feel a little bit like you're, you know, in, in Disney World rather than in the real world when you're inside of them. Um, but the hope and the ambition for the whole XR world is to really um, enable us to have these virtual worlds in which we spend much more time interacting. Um, and those virtual worlds are most of them, the VR headsets, whether it's Galea from, you know, Microsoft or uh, any of these other uh, technologies, Oculus, it's, you know, the meta one, they're, they're trying to embed both sensors that pick up everything from facial, you know, changes, eye tracking, but also neural sensors that pick up your brain activity, uh, both at the head and on the wrist as the way you interface with these other technologies. And when you layer onto that generative AI that can construct and reconstruct I worry about not only the brain's perception in those environments, but the ability to easily manipulate the brain. Because, you know, as they say, perception is reality. Mm -hmm. You can continuously change your perception in ways that manipulate the brain. And here's here's one that terrifies me. So deep fakes, right? Deep fakes um, are getting better and better, as you know, or worse and worse, depending on how you want to characterize it. Um, and it turns out that you know, you could take a person's face, like a politician's face, uh, and with generative AI, subtly change it, you know, tell the algorithm, like, make this picture of, um, you know, pick your least favorite politician, uh, subtly different so that it would be imperceptible by the human eye that you made any changes, even to the person themselves, but make it so that um, the changes lead a human to trust that person more and to trust what they're saying more. And it would make tiny changes to, you know, the way their eyes moved, the uh, kind of curl of their lips, the symmetry of their face. And you wouldn't be able to tell, but it would trigger greater trust in your brain. That's terrifying when you think about the precise ways in which you can manipulate human brains through changing the constructive environment that they're operating in. That's interesting. I've always thought about the more grand or overt deep fakes, which terrify me, right? Yeah. Uh, all you need is a world leader saying in a deep fake that they declare war on another nation, right? I mean, if somebody wants some terrorist yeah. was able to weaponize that technology, but that may be even scarier. All you need is the tiniest little nudge one way or the other to engender or whatever trust. Let's talk about smart cap technologies. I didn't yeah. know this existed until I read about it in your book. I'll just throw it out there. What is smart cap? Yeah. You know, one of the things I will say is that uh, 
even neuroscientists who are deep in this field read the book and they're like, oh my God, I didn't know that that was happening or I didn't know that that existed. It's part of why I wrote it, right? Is to like, we need somewhere where all of this is documented. But Smart Cap has been around for more than a decade. Their company out of Australia, they were, um, I think, bought by another company, maybe out of Japan, that um, uh, have been selling to companies worldwide what they call their life band technology. It's basically a headband that can be put into a baseball cap or uh, a hard hat or train conductor's cap, which have these brain sensors that I've been talking about that pick up the electrical activity in the brain, but they've been selling it to companies to monitor employees for fatigue levels. Um, and you know, I'll say this, which is as, as creepy as that sounds, they have attempted to do this as absolutely responsibly as they possibly can, which is the data that they collect from the brain is on device only. It's not transmitted to the cloud or, you know, the not mined for other data. And then it's overwritten on device, meaning that what you could do is mine that data to learn a whole bunch more information from the employees than they otherwise do. They're using an algorithm that just extracts fatigue levels on a score of one to five and then gives that information both to the employee to tell them whether they need to take a break, but also to the managers um, and, you know, kind of command central so that they can know whether the person is dangerously tired or awake. Um, and I would say if I had to design the technology in a way that would be the least intrusive, it would do all of those things. It would keep the data on device. Um, it would not transmit it anywhere else. It would overwrite the raw brainwave data and it would only use the extracted feature of fatigue levels in a score of one to five that you would ideally only give to the individual, not also give to the employer. Um, but uh, other companies can do exactly the same thing. And instead of overwriting it on device, they can send that data with rich, what I call raw brainwave data, the kind of full spectrum of information from the brain, which then could be mind for much more than just are they tired or awake so a long distance interstate truck driver is he's been at it too long his vision is blurry he said he shouldn't be behind the wheel an right. employer would be able to know that remotely using this headband yeah and you know i should say there's already a lot of tracking features that are in trucks to do this or in cars to do this many people have driver assist technology in their cars that try to predict whether or not they're sleepy or awake by doing things like cameras and sensors that look at the road and try to see whether um, you know the way your car is shifting relative to the lines on the road suggests that you are starting to get tired or the way your hands are moving the wheels suggests that you're starting to get tired or more intrusively for truck drivers, a lot of times there's in uh, cab cameras that are literally trained on the person's face and can see inside of the entire cab and remotely can be monitored by managers to see far more than whether they're tired or awake. But the same idea, these sensors are being used for truck drivers to monitor whether they're tired or awake and they're being sent in real time back to command center. So it's a piece of information which I say and I kind of provide as an example in the book, which is the right to mental privacy any privacy interest is not absolute. And we've never recognized individuals as having absolute right to privacy. And that's true, I think, when it comes to mental privacy too, which is different than freedom of thought that we can talk about. And so it's an example I give in the book to say, like, maybe done right. Maybe, you know, for a commercial driver where lives are at stake and the only thing that you're trying to figure out from them is if they're tired or awake, maybe they don't have such a strong interest in you know, whether they're falling asleep at the wheel is they're driving a 40 ton truck down the freeway. And that might be the kind of instance in which we think it's okay for the kind of surveillance of brain activity. Talking here with Professor Nita Farahani. She is author of the book, The Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology. My first thought when I hear about headbands that can read brain waves is this sounds like Christmas for totalitarian regimes. <laughs> Governments would love to be able to monitor their people to gauge dissents, right? I mean, you've spoken, you've written about this kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm Iranian American. My first thought in most of this was uh, this is terrifying in the hands of an authoritarian regime. Um, and with all of my extended family in Iran, 
um, who are afraid to speak, who've been subject to significant persecution themselves over time, who every time I've ever talked with them are afraid to ever say any dissident word against the government for fear of surveillance. I've often thought like, okay, well, what if literally their thoughts could be read by the government? And it turns out that you know, I, it's not something you have to imagine. It's already happening in China where, you know, train conductors and factory workers and even students in classrooms are require, required to wear brain sensors. And the brain sensors are being monitored, not just by, you know, the employers, but by the state. And OK, forgive me. I must interject quickly. Yeah. This is happening now. We're not talking about some theoretical future scenario. This is this going is on. OK, this is, this is this is literally right now. All right. People are aware yeah. that China has employees wearing brain monitoring devices right now. Right now. Okay. I mean, I don't know if the second, because I think it might I be. I got you. No, no, you no. Can, yeah. In the in, in the <laughs> contempor- in this cultural moment, it's going yeah. on. In this cultural moment, it's going on. In this cultural moment, workers are required to wear brain sensors in China. And in this moment, there are even reports that people who are required to wear brain sensors their brains are being interrogated by uh, showing them, for example, images or political propaganda from the Communist Party and seeing how their brain reacts to that. Um, and that's today. This isn't like we don't have to imagine Orwellian future. It's it's happening. It's arrived, at least in China. And there are law enforcement offices across the world where criminal suspects are being brought into interrogation rooms and their brains are being interrogated by requiring that they put on neural sensors, brain sensors, while they're shown different images of crime scene details to see whether or not their brain signal recognition and response to memories. This is not science fiction. This is not some movie called Minority Report. This is today happening across the world. And the question, I mean, the reason I wrote this book is both to you know, sound the alarm, like, hey, everybody, wake up, this is happening. But also, it's a moment before, because this is happening, but it's not happening at scale across the world. All the tech titans are at the table, they're all coming forward with products that are embedding these brain sensors into our earbuds and watches and headbands and tattoos and everything else. But it hasn't hit the mass market just yet, right? It's coming all within the next couple of years which means we could do things differently before then. We could make some smart choices so that we're looking at a future where, you know, in the same way that you're comfortably wearing your Apple Watch, you're comfortably wearing your brain sensors without worrying about living in a totalitarian Orwellian nightmare. And not because you've been normalized and lulled into, you know, uh, believing that it's okay when it's not, because it actually would be okay in that world. I'm stuck on... Tattoos. I'm sorry. Did you say tattoos? <laughs> I did tattoos? Say tattoos. Yeah. Wearable tattoos. Think like think like a little flexible, clear bandage that you could just put right behind your ear. Um, that is it has sensors and makes really good contact with your skin. Um, wearable tattoos that you know could be worn there and could be worn, you know, kind of in the back of the head and places where you could touch your scalp directly. There are these wearable tattoos that allow you to have the sensors directly on your skin rather than having to wear some other device that the sensors are embedded into. So what you think I'm we're coming to a point where I could say, call my wife. I could just think that. And yeah. and my wife would be called on some device. I mean, I just think think the thought without doing anything. Yeah, you might think, hey, Siri, call my wife. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, I feel <laughs> kind of, right. Can we reverse the streams in, in the future? I know this is speculation, but if brain waves can be read, can they oh, be yeah. altered? Right. Can somebody reverse those streams and not to We're be too Star Trek? We're not in the future Trek. again, Seth. We're here today. No, the second half of my no. book is hacking the brain. It's hacking, hacking, right? I mean, so yes, there are already stimulation devices. Some of the sensors are already two ways. The implanted devices can already read and write to the brain. I give an example of a good positive use just to make you feel a little bit better for a moment, right? Which is there was a patient named Sarah who, and that's a code name, but um, who, you know, she described herself as really being terminal with depression, that she no longer had a life worth living, that she was at the end of the line. Um, and she had tried all of the conventional treatments. All of them had failed. And uh, 
researchers and scientists and her clinicians were able to implant electrodes into her brain and to trace the electrical signals when she was the most symptomatic. And then like a pacemaker inside the brain, they could, as that firing happened, stimulate the you know, activity in her brain such that it interrupted that pattern. She wouldn't continue to have those same symptoms. And it has literally cured her of addiction. She now has a normal range of emotions, but that's writing to the brain through electrical stimulation of the brain. And, you know, that's the positive use case, right? I mean, in the well, same I way- I was thinking about um, another positive example that just popped into my head. Forgive the interruption, but that's- It's because I stimulated I'm like, it. You I'm like a it, child, but, yeah. you know, I'm <laughs> sitting at the edge of the table going, pick me. Yes. But uh, being able to like amputees with the artificial limbs, yes, right? They're totally. able to- think yep. I would like to move my fingers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, right now there's only about 40 people who have this implanted neurotechnology because it's difficult to get it into the brain, to not have it um, cause infection, to not cause brain damage on the way into embedding electrodes. And so there are companies like Cognition that I write about in the book who are trying to develop AR headsets that are embedded with electrodes that enable, for example, an ALS patient who can no longer communicate uh, through you know, ordinary speech or move to be able to use their brain activity to, to do that, um, to speak, to uh, stimulate um, you know, movements, to move a wheelchair, to turn lights on and off. Um, and writing to the brain has also been used for enhancement purposes. So people use transcranial direct current stimulation, which, you know, kind of speeds up the firing of the neurons in the prefrontal cortex. It's been used for a long time in the military uh, by athletes when they're training because it can enhance and reinforce learning. Um, it's been used in a lot of different contexts to write to the brain. But of course, you know, we can go to the scary place if you want to go to the scary place, which is... Um, if you know, I can choose to write to my own brain, or if I have implanted electrodes that um, you know I use as a pacemaker for the brain to you know control the symptoms of depression, could you also induce depression or induce pain or induce thoughts? Um, yeah, a hacker could do that, right? A hacker could hack into the technology and could you know precisely stimulate the brains in ways that could be deeply problematic and. You know, kind of the scary, uh, I guess all of this is scary. The scarier side of that is, you know, the fact that um, there's this, you know, kind of declaration that the human domain is the sixth domain of warfare and the countries are racing to develop weapons that are, you know, kind of purported brain control weapons. And that's not just influence campaigns like using TikTok. It is literally the development of of weapons to try to disable and disorient brains. So, you know, there's some frightening possibilities ahead given the misuse of the technology that is already occurring and that could occur in the future. Like an EMP for the mind. That's fascinating. I, you don't have to answer this, but since I've got you, <laughs> I've been, I mean, I got pissed off when I read about Elon Musk and the Neuralink monkeys and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Do you follow any of that? You're a bioethicist. Do you get into the experiments they're doing on animals with these Neuralink things? Yes, I do. I mean, I, I've been following all of the implanted neurotechnology companies very closely, and especially Elon Musk, because once Elon Musk is in the mix, you know, it brings a ton of attention both to the field, but also in some ways you hope that, you know, his kind of uh, approach, if you might call it that, might drive the field forward. Um, but, you know, you can't move fast and break things when you're talking about experimentation with people and with non-human primates. Um, and you can't rush through implanting neurotechnology and doing so without care for animals and, you know, treating animals and you know, instrumenting them in ways that, um, you know, do doesn't wait for one at a time to find out what's happening in order to safeguard uh, both animals during the research process, but also just the responsible progress of scientific research at all. So I've been disturbed by the reports, um, to say the least. I think it's not a good or responsible way to do science. Um, and at the same time, 
you know, I'm like Pollyanna. Like I, I, I still wish that the nanotainers that Elizabeth Holmes was talking about were real and that, you know, we had that technology. And I, I still wish and hope that the ability to use robotic surgery to have tiny, you know, uh, hair-like threads that enable implanting neurotechnology and, and enable people with paralysis and neurodegenerative diseases to be re-enabled might come true one day. Uh, so there's a part of me that really hopes it all works out in the end, but is deeply disconcerted by um, what we hear from reports coming out of Neuralink. It's messy. I mean, I, that's probably a way to sum it. Just freaking messy. You've been so generous with your time. I'm almost done, but I got a couple more real fast. <laughs> you mentioned Minority Report, one of my favorite films. There's a great Me scene too. where John Anderton walks in after he's had an eye transplant. He's in a mall and his retina is just scanned by some sensor on a wall. And it says, welcome. And this is certainly the case with facial recognition technology. Yeah. And some people have taken to wearing masks. I saw an article that was posted by the Civil Liberties Union in Europe. And the article was titled, Anti-Facial Recognition Masks, Accessories of the Future. Do I have the right to not be seen or scanned in public? Yeah. You see us walking around with uh, preventatives, you know, some kind of a prophylactic against being scanned in this world. So, um, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna do this a little tongue in cheek with you, which is, um, you know, the I I I thought maybe is uh, something to hand out with my book. I I might have like little neurosecurity caps, like tinfoil lined baseball caps for her, for people to wear who are really. Yeah. Yeah, I've thought you know, about. It. I mean, it. I make fun of the tinfoil hat crowd, but after reading your book, I thought, how much foil do I have, and how often right. do I have to change it out? Right? <laughs> right. Right. So I mean, I think it'll be simpler than that, which is I think you know for for the tinfoil. Uh, community, they can just choose not to wear the sensors. Um, and for me, I hope that that's what self-determination includes. I hope that's what cognitive liberty includes. I worry, especially in the context of work, of people being required to wear brain sensors and um, having very little choice in that context and and having to do so. Um, so I, I think it I don't know of any technology today that enables remote monitoring of the brain. Um, it still requires some contact of some sensor that is applied to the body in order for that detection to occur. And I think, you know, the right to cognitive liberty should include the right to choose not to wear any of that technology or to use that technology or to have it be necessary to interact with other technology. That may be difficult to achieve in a world in which it becomes the universal controller to all of the rest of our technology, in which case... Um, we will need some kinds of countermeasures, whether that's on off switches to be able to take a conference call without having my brain activity monitored at the same time, um, or, you know, having uh, a baseball cap with tinfoil around it that has lots of interference with the brain activity measurements that are happening at the same time, people will find a way to be able to have an off switch for the brain activity monitoring if it's in multifunctional devices. To bring us full circle, let's explore the term cognitive liberty you see this as something that like a human rights law or series of laws that should be enacted yeah so i see it as a, a new right which really directs us to update existing international human rights so um, it encompasses a bundle of existing human rights those rights are the right to privacy which needs to be explicitly updated to include mental privacy the right to freedom of thought which is um, already a human right, but it has primarily been interpreted to apply to uh, freedom of religion and belief, and it needs to be extended to apply to um, the right not to have your thoughts read and punished and manipulated, um, and the right to self-determination, which has been understood as a, a collective and a political right, but needs to be updated as a um, basic and fundamental individual right to self-determination, particularly over our brains and mental experiences. And I think the best way to do that is by recognizing um, it is an international human rights uh, at, by like the Human Rights Committee that oversees the um, international and uh, civil, the ICCPR, which implements the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But even just as a norm, right, even as a cultural, social and political norm, it has power and effect. Um, and so I think we need to demand 
that cognitive liberty be the way in which we operate in the digital age to give people those rights over their brains and mental experiences. And I hope we can codify it into law so that it has both the legal enforceability and the power of the norm across the globe. Read Nita Farahani's book, The Battle for Your Brain, which I will link in the description box. You have been a tremendous interview and a lot of fun to talk to. We move forward with caution and optimism. Would that be a fair way to say? Do you have caution and optimism? I have a lot of caution. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and, you seem optimistic. Good, like you said it yourself. Optimism. No, I have both. I, I mean, I believe about the I am future. not a cynic. Okay. Actually, I believe that this can be incredibly empowering if we get it right. My cynicism only comes as to whether or not people will mobilize to the call to action to get it right. And so I would say join the call to action, join the battle for your brain so that we can all be optimistic about the future together. Professor Nita Farahani, thanks again for talking to me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.